So my name's Brian. I'm an addiction psychiatrist, and I have the privilege of supporting some of the most vulnerable patients in LA County served by the Los Angeles <laughs> County Department of Mental Health. I have no conflicts of interest to dis disclose, and my pronouns are he, him, and his. So uh, I'm going to speak for about 40 minutes, take a few questions, and then we have a panel. That's kind of my portion of the morning. And then there's uh, another speaker this afternoon. What I'm going to cover during our next 40 or so minutes together, I'm going to cover some definitions and concepts. I'm going to talk about substance use disorder treatment, also known as addiction treatment in general. I'm going to talk about minority stress and trauma a bit. And then I'm going to talk about an approach to seeking or to engaging LGBT individuals who are seeking addiction services. So that's what I have planned for the next 40 minutes. And I'm thrilled that you get to join me on the journey. Every person has um, these four components to the human experience. We all have a biological sex. We all have a gender identity. We all have a gender expression, and we all have sexual orientation. And this does not matter whether you are gay, straight, cis, trans, we all have this. Many people don't necessarily need to think about it. That is, their assigned sex at birth matches a cisgender identity, matches a heterosexual identity. And culturally, those things are normative, and so you don't necessarily think about um, th that you have a sex or a sexual orientation or gender identity. But these are our, all four orthogonally related components. What does that mean? That means that the sex you're assigned at birth does not necessarily dictate what your gender identity is, which does not dictate what your gender expression is, which doesn't have any bearing necessarily on your sexual orientation. So with this framework, I want to talk about the gingerbread person. The gingerbread person has a gender identity, right? Somewhere between you know, man, woman, or gender queer potentially in the middle, and a gender expression between things that are masculine, potentially feminine, or uh, somewhere in between. Um, biological sex between sort of male and female, and um, uh, there's lots of terms that are oftentimes used uh, related to people who don't identify as male or female. Sometimes it's androgynous. Um, there have been, uh, the term intersex has been proposed. Uh, the term that I use is difference of sex development. Um, just because, you know, you can have uh, sex development in some ways that's atypical. And sexual orientation, heterosexual, uh, uh, gay, or bisexual. Okay, so biological sex, it can actually be determined by a number of different factors. I could give an entire lecture just on sex development. But suffice it to say that we have chromosomes that oftentimes but not always match up with the, the way external genitalia develop. And the way that sex is typically assigned at birth is that the baby's born, the obstetrician looks at the genitals, and that's it. That's the, tip, that's the typical process. Um, and if the, the obstetrician looks at the genitals and can't tell, or there's, um, in, in some ways, uh, sex development is atypical, it's uh, usually called a difference of sex development. Um, so that's sex development. Now, sexual orientation refers to a sexual attraction or arousal either to a particular body type or identity. And actually, uh, we think of heterosexual, uh, homosexuality, and bisexuality as sort of common forms of uh, sexual orientation. There's also some sexual orientations that have been identified and are listed in the DSM as pathologies or fetishisms or paraphilias. And um, these are distinct from sexual orientation identity terms. So there are people that actually identify as gay, straight, bisexual, lesbian. And the terms like homosexual or heterosexual generally are not identity terms. Those refer, refer to sexuality, but not necessarily how people identify in the world. Um, so to, uh, I, this is the construct that I use, is the components of sexual orientation include your sexual identity, that is how you label your sexual orientation. It could be gay, straight, bisexual, or other. Um, your sexual behavior, what you do sexually with other people, and then your sexual attraction. And so there are people, for example, that identify their sexual identity as straight. And their sexual attraction might be to people of different sexes. And their sexual behavior might be full abstinence. They may not have um, uh, sexual relations with other people, right? So those are people where you don't always get a perfect congruence between how one identifies one's actual attraction and then one's behavior. So there are, for example, straight men who have sex with other men that don't identify necessarily as gay or bisexual, um, that their behavior doesn't necessarily match their identity. Um, but those are sort of the components we think of of, of sexual orientation. So gender identity is distinct from sexual orientation. Sexual orientation is related to attraction, 
gender identity has to do with one's internal sense of gender. That's the experience, whoop, the experience of one's own gender. And it can correlate with the assigned sex at birth. It's generally called cisgender people. Um, but it can differ from it, and that generally refers to people who identify as transgender. And there are culturally established gender categories that usually serve as the basis for the formation of somebody's identity. So um, in the United States and in most Western cultures, we have a binary between male and female. Now that doesn't mean that those are the only two options, but culturally those are the sort of the normative two genders. Um, not every culture has followed that, right? So I know in Native American culture, there's been sort of people who identify as two-spirit, who, um, it, which is a gender identity that's neither male or female, but is sort of a, a, a distinct category. And I do want to talk a bit about gender transition. It's sort of, it's early to jump into this, but um, I want to be clear about what we mean. When there are people whose internal sense of gender does not match uh, the, uh, the gender that they were assigned at birth, or the sex that they were assigned at birth, um, there are people who may choose to undergo what's called gender transition. Gender transition typically refers to the process where somebody makes a change in their gender expression or in um, actual, their, uh, uh, uses medical procedures to adjust their physiology or anatomy in order to comport their own bodies with their internal sense of gender. And uh, I know that this is small, so I'm not going to, you know, torture you by reading all of it. But I do want to say, for some people, there's a self-awareness or a, a self-realization that there's uh, a difference between the, the gender that they were assigned at birth and their internal sense of gender. Um, and oftentimes, but not always, it can be helpful for somebody who, um, who's in, you know, who may identify as transgender to get some support around that. Now, I'm a psychiatrist. It's sort of easy for me to say that. Oh, you should go get support. But I will point out that um, seeking assistance from a mental health professional can be an important part of uh, transition. It's not mandatory, right? It's not that, that being transgender requires some special treatment. Um, but I do think that it can be helpful, particularly if people want to navigate like the no. medical treatment world to be able to like coordinate referrals and get no. letters Can I call to you right back transition. A um, and then some people sort of stop there. They realize that their uh, gender identity okay. is transgender. Sorry, I'm in the middle of trying to fix something. And, that's kind of, and, and they realize that, but that's right. all that they sort of choose to do about it. But over some time frame, there are people that then choose to change their appearance and their gender expression to coincide with their internal sense of gender. And for some people, that might involve clothing changes, that might involve hairstyling changes, that might involve makeup changes. Um, and, and for some people, it involves none of those things. But that there is some change in their appearance and expression to coincide with their internal sense. Um, and uh, oftentimes, you know, sort of concurrent with this, there's a coming out process. What do we mean by coming out? Coming out's when somebody generally shares their internal experience with the world. Um, it is, for most people, a lifelong process. Um, I think of coming out, uh, so I, uh, just full disclosure, identify as a he, him, and his. I am a cisgender gay man. And I um, was going to be in Louisville this week, so I uh, needed to buy flowers for my husband because, you know, I wasn't going to be there for Valentine's Day. And so, um, and so I went to the flower shop and I bought flowers, and uh, the flower shop person said, oh, don't worry, these are going to be so lovely for your wife. I thought, ah, this is a chance to come out again, right? Um, uh, uh, and, and, and people who are um, uh, identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender oftentimes are in the position of coming out on a continual basis. And it kind of depends on a situation. Like there are some people um, who don't necessarily, uh, um, by virtue of their gender expression, don't necessarily need to come out. That, 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 that is, um, so there are people who sometimes just make it clear by virtue of their gender expression what their um, gender identity or sexual orientation is. But it really depends. And so point is, is that for many people, there's a coming out process that coincides with a change process around one's gender expression. And for many people, that concludes their transition. Now, there are some people that then get referred from mental health for hormone therapy, on uh, gender affirming hormone therapy or gender affirming procedures. And there's a whole, again, we could probably give a whole talk just about gender transition. But I put this slide up um, as a way of uh, illustrating that for people with transgender gender identities, oftentimes there is a process associated. It, um, and the process involves an internal process, for some people, an actual sort of externalized change process. 
and, uh, and usually a coming out process. Okay. Um, just uh, so that everyone knows, there is a, a guidebook to gender transition. It's called the World Professional Association on Transgender Health Standards of Care. Their latest standards were published in 2011. Um, this is the link. Anyway. Um, and the University of Louisville uh, the Division of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry um, supports uh, youth that are uh, exploring their gender identity and transition in accordance with those standards of care. Um, the experience related to uh, uh, having a minority status can be quite stressful. Um, and uh, that's true sort of regardless whether you're talking about people um, of non-majority religious affiliation, whether you're talking about people with different abilities or ableism, you're talking about people of different age groups, but minority status can be stressful. And what we find is for people with the transgender identity, that is the interpersonal trauma, the inner sort of discord between somebody's experience of themselves and between the gender role in which they were assigned, tends to be highest um, before any transition process and improves really throughout the transition process. But the, the interpersonal, so the intrapsychic process during transition tends to get a lot better. Um, but the interpersonal process, the sort of um, discrimination um, and uh, frankly violence that is sometimes enacted against transgender people tends to peak in the middle of a transition process when people are still solidifying their presentation and their, <coughs> and their externalized identities. And that we find that as people stabilize in their lives, as people sort of uh, are, you know, uh, eventually sort of craft um, their uh, living according to sort of authentically to their internal sense of self, that we find that the interpersonal trauma eventually goes down. Um, but kind of in the middle, you get all kinds of stuff where people, this gender people, there's all these like bathroom bills that get created. I mean, there's all these sort of, you know, interpersonal traumas that, that, uh, that, that are created um, that oftentimes peak as people in the middle of their transition process. Point is, is um, that gender transition can be life-changing and hugely affirming of mental health for transgender people and that the trauma sort of related to that improves inter, uh, in, uh, intrapsychically throughout or interpersonally, um, intrapersonally, but interpersonally uh, we do see sort of a peak. Um, gender identity is not determined by appearance or observed, observed, observed gender expression. And I was taking an English class in college, and um, somebody uh, asked my professor, well, you know, how many transgender people, you know, have you run into on campus? Being like, there's, basically, there's no transgender people here. And he says, well, how, how would I know? Right? Um, I, I don't expect everybody that's transgender is necessarily going to come out, right? In the same way, I don't expect everyone that's LGBT to come out unless they're buying flowers. Um, okay, that's a joke. Um, uh, gender expression. So I mentioned gender identity, that is internal sense of self, and I sort of alluded to gender expression earlier, but gender expression really is um, whether or not do you conform with societal norms around the way that you're supposed to dress um, and the way that you're supposed to behave as somebody of a certain gender. So I, um, I, I, I would say that I'm comporting right now wearing a suit with a lavalier and you know, belt and these shoes with stereotypical masculine sort of uh, gender expression. The way my hair looks, um, the way that I've shaved. I mean, this is the kind of standard, uh, I, I would say, relatively normative uh, male gender expression. If I was up here, say, in drag, six inch heels, big dress, huge wig, and lots of makeup, you would say this is somebody with um, who might be gender non-conforming, right? I'm still male. I don't, I, I, I don't identify as something other than male. Um, but uh, as one example, there are people in the drag queen community who, whose gender identity is generally a, a, a still you know, cisgender male, but whose gender expression might be very different than cultural norms around that. Um, and so as a way of illustrating this, so you can have a masculine gender identity that is, you can say that I'm a man, um, and that a masculine gender expression, and then you would so, say that, that person's gender conforming. But you can have a masculine gender identity, but have a feminine gender expression, and then be gender non-conforming. And then if you say, well, I don't buy the gender binary at all, like that's not something, I don't, I don't do, you know, I'm not sort of a binary thinker, then, um, in my gender expression, you might be somebody that, at least in this schematic, we label androgynous, somebody that doesn't necessarily fit culturally norms around gendered expression or behavior. And then sort of same thing with um, 
uh, people who don't identify necessarily with the masculine or feminine gender identity who say I'm non-binary, I'm genderqueer. There's all kinds of uh, terms that are oftentimes used for people that sort of reject identities as either male or female. And so this is uh, a, a screenshot of a music video by a uh, the lead singer of Rilo Kylie, who um, she herself identifies as female, but in the course of the video has a whole number of different gender expressions that, that range between what we think of as uh, culturally feminine and culturally masculine gender expressions. Um, and as a way of sort of illustrating the differences you see in gender expression. So I want to actually, I introduced the gingerbread person 1.0, but actually I think um, a better model is the gingerbread person 2.0 which does not posit that male and femaleness are binary or so in any ways opposite to each other, because they're not. And so you can actually have a gender identity that has varying degrees of maleness or, or womanness, and there are people who say, I actually am non-gendered. Um, and so this doesn't then create, instead of there being an axis with two poles, and there's some way opposed, you actually have an axis where those things are orthogonally related. And so same thing with gender expression. There are people, so um, I've seen, uh, I have friends actually, who, um, have very masculine components to their gender expression um, in terms of the way that their bodies are, their, the, the way that their hair is, but when they dress and drag have very both masculine and feminine components to the way that they're doing their gender expression, at least at that particular time, as opposed to people who are agender, right? They, they don't identify or their, their gender expression is relatively neutral and, and free of what we think of as masculinizing or feminizing components. Um, and so uh, biological sex can include varying degrees of maleness and femaleness, and attraction can go from asexual to being attracted to men, being attracted to women, being attracted to women you know, uh, in, uh, uh, around companionship and men around sex activities. I mean, there's all sorts of components of sexual orientation that we could get into. But this, I think, is sort of a more nuanced understanding than trying to say that somehow male and female are on opposite sides of the poles. And then just other terms we should be aware of is there's a term ally that's oftentimes used. Ally refers to cisgender or heterosexual people who support um, uh, sexual and gender diversity. And then, uh, so the term LGBT gets thrown around. That refers to lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender. LGB are sexual orientation identity terms. Transgender is a gender identity term. But that's an, a term that's oftentimes used. Um, I tried to find the longest acronym that I could. Um, <laughs> To, to, to sort of illustrate that there's other, that there's other acronyms. And so um, LGBTTIQQ2SA stands for Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender, Transsexual, Intersex, Queer, Questioning, Two-Spirit, and Allies, right? Um, and, and so it, uh, as you can tell, I don't know if it's, I've made it obvious so far, but the terminology around these terms can be quite messy. And I've used the term intersex here. Intersex is actually not... Um, a, a universally established term. So what do I mean by that? Well, the Intersex Society of North America is a group devoted to addressing um, differences of sex development and trying to support um, uh, deferring any surgical modification of atypical genitalia, um, unless there's sort of a medical necessity around a managing malignancy risk, um, until somebody is old enough in order to be able to choose such uh, any such procedures for themselves. Um, but intersex is sometimes also used by people who say, I don't identify as man or woman, I identify as somewhere in between. It has nothing to do with genitalia development, it has everything to do with just, you know, uh, somebody rejecting a gender binary. And so um, what I oftentimes do in cases where somebody is using a term is uh, I provide, uh, I sort of gently inquire, so what do you mean by that? Okay, so you identify, like, um, what is being, so I, I, I uh, put two-spirited up here. I think I know what two-spirited means, but if I'm talking to somebody, what do they think that it means? So to just be open and, and uh, have a bit of humility around terms that people use in all kinds of different ways. Okay, so how many LGBT people are there? Sort of depends on how you count. Um, oftentimes there, there, there is uh, a, a, when I was in college, there was sort of like a, a a culturally assumed number of like one in 10. Um, but actually, it's probably less than that, somewhere between 2.2% and 5.6%, uh, kind of depending on who's counting at the time. Um, the last number that I looked at a, from a population-based survey was somewhere around 3.5%. But we do know that um, the terms sort of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender are themselves culturally defined. And so therefore, different generations of people have different cultural notions related to what those terms mean. 
Um, we know that 0.6% of adults in the United States, or about 1.4 million people, identify as transgender. And we see that it's actually much higher in um, younger generations than in older generations. So there's a generational effect around um, people's identification with being lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender. Now, Louisville actually ranks as the 11th um, among major US cities for uh, hosting LGBT populations. Um, so there it is, uh, you know, somewhere between um, Hartford and Virginia Beach. Um, and actually, if you sort of look at the, the percentage, you know, so San Francisco is at the top at 6.2, but as you, and, you know, LA where I live is a 4.6, but Louisville is like right there. I mean, you know, within, I would say a percentage, certainly within a percentage point of um, cities uh, like Los Angeles, Salt Lake City, Denver, Boston. Um, so, I, I, you know, I think of, of, of Louisville as having a, a really important cultural impact um, in this part of the country. So uh, I mentioned that being LGBT can be stressful. And so I want to sort of uh, put up, and this is, you know, again, we could spend a whole 40 minutes just on the minority stress model. But there's this idea that you have circumstances in the environment that um, interact with minority sta status or intersect with minority status to create a minority stress process that includes prejudice events, as well as expectations of rejection, concealment, and internalized homophobia or transphobia or internalized isms um, that compound with general stressors that can lead to um, mental health outcomes that can be negative or positive. And the mediators of whether or not a stressful event uh, leads to a mental health outcome depends on um, various characteristics of minority identity and a number of resiliency factors. So that's a really complicated way of saying this next slide, which is social support, emotional openness, openness and uh, hope and optimism can create a lower reactivity to prejudice and support psychological health. And people that have poor social supports um, uh, uh, that are not particularly emotionally open and who are not particularly strongly future oriented, people who have like an external locus of control who do a lot of externalizing, um, oftentimes uh, have a higher reactivity to prejudice and it can lead to poorer psychological health. Does that kind of make sense? All right. Um, so as a way of sort of illustrating this, we know among people who identify as gender nonconforming, and I mentioned younger generations um, ha uh, uh, have an increasing uh, are increasingly more likely to identify as LGB or T. Um, but overall, uh, in this California population-based survey, 17% of the youth between the ages of 12 and 17 um, identified as uh, gender nonconforming in this particular sample and had a significantly higher rate of severe psychological distress compared to people who were gender conforming. Um, there are other population-based surveys, and I, I do want to sort of talk about addiction services. Now we've gone through identity terms and, 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 uh, and demo, uh, demographics and what we know about sort of numbers to talk about what do we know about substance use disorders. So the NISAR, the National Epidemiologic Survey of Alcohol and Related Conditions, um, long national survey looking at a whole number of substance use and men mental health indicators, found that the odds of developing a substance use disorder compared to people who were straight. Um, for uh, lesbian women, it was three times as likely to have alcohol use disorder, 11.3% um, uh, more likely to have cannabis use disorder, and 14% um, uh, uh, more likely to have, or uh, not 14%, 14 times more likely to have uh, substance use disorder. And for bisexual women, you also see sort of elevated rates of alcohol use disorder, cannabis, and other substance use. And then for, uh, for gay men, it was about three times for alcohol use disorder, 4.4 for cannabis use disorder. Um, but you see sort of dramatically increased risks related to substance use, which is not because being LGB or T is somehow intrinsically associated with substance use, but because the minority stress experienced by people who are LGB or T in the context of the world oftentimes creates an opportunity for people to use substances as a solution. And for people to use substances, at least in my experience as an addiction psychiatrist, people use substances as a solution to a problem. And that substance then becomes its own problem, right? So you have to then address the problem that was the solution to the problem to, to sort of begin with. For tobacco, there's elevated prevalence of smoking in LGBT population, or LGB populations. This uh, sample did not include trans folks. Um, between 1.5 and 2.5 percent. And so I, I've mentioned now um, what we know about lesbian women, bisexual women, gay men, and bisexual men. And I've talked a little bit about uh, LGB folks, but what about trans people? Well, na the NISARC survey did not ask questions about gender identity. So we don't have any information about gender identity from that particular 
uh, epidemiologic survey. So what we have from trans people are generally convenient samples in, that are not national. They tend to be localized convenient samples. And as a result, um, uh, it limits the generalizability. So I'll present what we do know about you know, the substance use in transgender populations, but sort of take these with a grain of salt because the generalability of this information may not necessarily be fully generalizable here to, to Louisville, Kentucky. So the New York Transgender Project I looked at self-reported prevalence of substance use among the prior six months among um, uh, trans women that found heavy alcohol use, high uh, marijuana use, cocaine stimulant, and opiate use. Um, biological assays of non-alcohol substances were um, uh, uh, approximately 10% or less. Um, there was a 2014 study of individuals entering addiction treatment in publicly funded um, uh, programs in San Francisco. We do know that among the 14 or so thousands admitted between 2007 and 2009, um, they did ask questions about gender and sexual orientation. And a significant portion of the transgender treatment seekers declined to answer when they were queried about gender. Transgender women were over the six times as likely to be seeking treatment for methamphetamine use, um, but there were no difference in the primary substance for which transgender and cisgender people sought treatment. So you can imagine if you're asking a sample of people seeking substance use, virtually all of those people are going to report substance use. So this is not a useful measure for seeing what's the overall prevalence of substance use, but can give you some idea of what do we know about the people that are substance uh, treatment seeking. And so we do know that oftentimes transgender people decline to answer questions about gender, probably because they, they're worried if it's safe to do so. Um, and uh, that we saw trans women more likely to seek treatment for methamphetamine use. Transgender individuals were more likely than cisgender to ever have a psychiatric diagnosis or have been to be prescribed a psychiatric medication. A meta-analysis looking at 18 studies on um, uh, substance use disorders in LGBT youth, th there was a higher odds of substance use in this population. Um, it was uh, almost twice of what we saw for heterosexual youth, um, uh, over three times as likely for bisexual youth, and four times higher for uh, women who identify as LGB or T. And that was corroborated by similar trends in other sort of parts of the world. Um, so, so that's kind of what we know, which I, I sort of have to say is not much. I actually think that there's a whole like imperative for good epidemiologic research around LGBT populations, particularly T populations like transgender people that we just don't have. Um, and there's again, a whole number of convenient samples looking at people who are transgender to sort of self-report, but that is very different than what we would be able to accomplish if we had um, gender identity questions embedded into large national surveys where you could actually get a good epidemiologic report on what is the actual prevalence. Okay, so that's what we know so far. There, uh, there was a survey looking at substance use treatment programs in the United States. And 11.8%, uh, this was a survey of all treatment programs sort of um, known to the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration. And 11.8% um, say we offer LGBT specific services. So then the investigators actually uh, looked into what are is the treatment that you offer. If you say you offer LGBT responsive services or specific services, what do you offer? And of that 11.8%, 70.8% were no different than what is offered in uh, just general population substance abuse treatment programs. Um, there is the perception of significant barriers to accessing treatment. So I mentioned in the San Francisco study, um, treatment seekers declined to answer questions about gender. My hypothesis, because there were safety issues around that. I wonder if it's safe to do that. And so there's a perception um, uh, that there is, again, a significant barrier to accessing treatment. So we know that in programs that do have bona fide LGBT services, LGBT um, clients are more likely to engage in treatment that addresses issues of gender and sexuality. Um, there's less compliance, as you can imagine, uh, to treatment that are recommended by people who are overtly homophobic or transphobic, and accessible treatment for transgender people is uh, uh, particularly lacking. So. What uh, I, I imagine many people in the room sort of know what I'm talking about when I talk about addiction treatment, but let me just be clear. Um, when I'm talking about addiction treatment, I'm talking about the treatment that is focused on um, reducing or creating abstinence or recovery from substance use and um, recognizing that substance use is oftentimes a tool that people use to address some problem that they're having. And then that tool then became itself a problem. So you have to address the substance use, but I think good addiction treatment then also needs to look at what were the reasons that you were using in the first place and how do you address those? 
Um, so there's a variety of psychotherapies that have been validated. So SAMHSA lists 12-step um, facilitation and, and uh, peer treatment, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, motivational enhancement therapy, community reinforcement, contingency management, multisystemic therapy, and multisystemic family therapy, all are, are multidimensional family therapies, all being well-validated evidence-based approaches. There's also medications for addiction treatment, but not all uh, substances respond to medications. So alcohol, opioid, and tobacco use disorders all have medications that can impact substance use, but there is no medication that has been FDA approved for cannabis use disorder, amphetamine use disorder, cocaine use disorder, um, hallucinogen use disorder. Those are the, the substance use disorders for which there are medication targets. Um, and so when I conceptualize addiction treatment, I think um, you need uh, therapy and psychotherapy or counseling can be very helpful with skills. Right? How do you teach somebody how to tolerate their lives in a world uh, without substance use? Those of you in the treatment community will probably know what I mean when I say live life on life's terms. Right? How do you live life on life's terms? Um, I also think a component of addiction treatment needs to be support. And support is different than counseling. Counseling is about skills. Support is about what is the milieu, the people, places, and things with whom you interact on a daily basis. Now, you need skills in order to be able to navigate those things, the people, places, and things that you navigate on a daily basis. But who do you have to call when things aren't going well? Do you have a sponsor? Do you have a group that you go to? And for some people, their treatment is support. They go to meetings. They connect with other people, maybe they work some steps, some steps and then may teach somebody some skills, but support might be the major, major ingredient for some people. And medications, I think, also have a very important role to play in supporting people with uh, alcohol, tobacco, and uh, opioid use disorders. Um, particularly for opioid use disorders, medications can be very strongly effective. So for, for patients that I see, and you know, I'm an addiction psychiatrist, so I see patients, um, I want to make all three of those a component of somebody's treatment. And I think if I don't offer somebody the full range of options, I'm not doing my job. So how is this relevant for LGBT folks? Well, for LGBT folks in particular, I would say support is paramount. You want to be sure that people have the support in order to lead a healthful life that you're giving somebody skills, that the skills, the steps, and the therapies aren't necessarily different for LGBT folks than they are for other folks, but the context, the sort of set and the setting in which those skills are learned does need to be attuned to people who, um, to the people's uh, real life context. And then the medications do not work differently for LGBT people than other people. We all have roughly equivalent physiology. Okay, so what do we know about treatment in LGBT populations? Interestingly, studies have not found a significant difference between LGBT-specific treatment and general treatment for LGBT people. So um, this guy, Steve Shapta, he's in Los Angeles, has done a lot of research um, trying to show a difference in um, LGBT-specific treatment for methamphetamine use disorder for gay men. And he published in 2005 a study of 162 methamphetamine-dependent um, or this was in, you know, this was before the DSM was published, so the DSM-5 was published, so it was called methamphetamine dependence. We would call it amphetamine use disorder now. Looking at um, CBT, consistency management, combined CBT with consistency management, and culturally tailored gay-specific treatment. All groups got better, but there was no difference or improvement around the gay-specific treatment um, as compared with the uh, other treatment modalities. And another study, also published by Steve Shapton in 2008, compared gay-specific treatment um, to, uh, and gay-specific social service uh, uh, therapy in a community health clinic, and both groups showed significant reductions in, the great, uh, in their rates of alcohol and drug use at the end of the 16-week study. Um, and there was durability at one-year uh, follow-up. And then Morganson compared MI with CBT in a group of 188 men who have sex with men with alcohol use disorder. Again, both therapy types led to decreases in drinking. So it tells me that general treatment can be effective for LGBT people. And we haven't, although there's great anecdotal evidence that LGBT people um, seek treatment in LGBT specific programs um, more than in non-LGBT specific programs, the actual treatment itself, once it's delivered, can be effective, even if it's not necessarily gay-tailored or gay-specific. Um, so from my perspective, the outcomes of these studies suggest that LGBT-affirming programs don't necessarily need to have a lot of fancy LGBT-specific stuff in them, as long as um, the clinicians involved, in my view, are reasonably free of homophobia, transphobia, and heterosexism. That's really important. Like, if you're, if you're running a program, you don't necessarily, I mean, there is a role for LGBT-specific programming, and I'll sort of get into that. But 
the floor, what I would expect every program to be able to do is have clinicians reasonably free from the isms that drive people out of treatment, right? Be reasonably free of, again, tra homophobia, transphobia, heterosexism that leads to people who are LGBT dropping out of treatment. They have generally positive regard for our patients. To welcome and promote openness about sexual orientation and gender identity in the therapeutic setting and be familiar with many of the issues commonly faced by LGBT people. I think if we were to inculcate this list in treatment in general, it would make a transformative impact on LGBT communities being able to access LGBT treatment. That said, LGBT programs I do think have a role, um, LGBT specific groups or LGBT specific programs, and their role in my view is when people's substance use is tied to struggles with coming out, um, is tied to difficulty talking about one's personal life, is tied to inner conflict around sexual orientation or gender identity, and is a significant factor affecting their substance use. Um, people who's, who've been traumatized and their trauma is due to homophobic or transphobic attacks. And for people who drug associated activities, such as compulsive sex with methamphetamine, may be difficult to discuss in a general population setting. In these settings, I think it makes sense for there to be protected um, affinity space for LGBT people to be able to address their substance use. Um, but if you are, and I sort of, I mean no offense when I say this, but if you're like uh, an out lesbian woman that's been out forever and you drink a lot of alcohol and your alcohol use is not necessarily related to like your specific sexuality, but is related to sort of general life stressors, in my view, you don't necessarily need to send that person to a sort of segregated or specific group just because she's lesbian, right? Um, I think it really depends on what is the drive for the substance use. Is it specific um, to somebody's LGBT identity? And would it be difficult to address in the context of general treatment? So I support there being LGBT specific programs, but I do not think that the only place that an LGBT person can do well is an LGBT specific program. Does that make sense? All right, cool. So I want to talk about a case of a 32-year-old patient named George, or client. I'm a doctor, so I say patient, and I mean no, I, I try not, to, I'm not being paternalistic. It's a term that I learned. Um, but uh, the individual, 32-year-old individual walks into a treatment program seeking addiction treatment. What sexual orientation or gender-related information would be useful to know about Jordan? What do you guys think? What did you say? Pronouns. Pronouns, yeah. So it'd be useful to know information about the, their gender, their gender identity, gender, uh, gender expression. And in some cases, it's useful to know about sexual orientation and sexual, uh, uh, sexual um, practices. But at the very least, no pronouns. I think that that would be useful to know. Um, so there's a whole push for pronouns now. That um, part, when somebody walks into your office, one of the things that you ask is, um, what pronouns would you like me to use? So I started this presentation talking about, um, I identify as he, him, and his. And an alternative would be she, her, or hers. But there's a whole number of other pronouns that actually people can identify with. So um, Webster's has changed they, them, and theirs from being a plural pronoun, referring to groups of people, to actually being a singular pronoun for people that don't identify as a he or a her. Um, so they, them, and theirs. And then there's all kinds of other variations like A, M, and air, V, V, and Vs, Z, them, and theirs. Um, I mean, I could sort of go on. But there's a whole number of pronouns that people might want to use. It can be challenging. It's challenging for me when somebody identifies as a them, or I'll just be real honest, as a them, a them, or a Z, or something other than he or her. But if somebody identifies that way, and that's the way they want to be referred to, it does not, it's no skin off my back from my perspective, to address people how they want to be addressed, right? I don't, um, there are all sorts of cases where healthcare providers take this stance of, um, I need to address you by your biological sex. Why? There's absolutely no reason to address somebody anything other than they want to be addressed. It would be like if somebody said, uh, hi, my name is Michael, and I was like, hey, John. <laughs> Why, why am I calling them John? It just is, like they, they've told me that their name is Michael. Um, okay, so there's a, a New York Times article on sort of uh, who's they, witnessing a great explosion in the way human beings are allowed to express our gender identities. Um, we've always been, again, allowed, but I think there's now a cultural relaxation over um, uh, uh, what is sort of uh, culturally normative around um, expressing gender. So if Jordan looked like this, what pronoun would you use? <laughs> 
Might be tough. It might be tough, right? You might need to ask. What if Jordan looked like this? Or what if Jordan looked like this? Right? Port, port, uh, the point is, it's important to ask. And then how would you collect sexual orientation or gender identity? Or uh, for those of you that write in this field, SOGI. Um, how would you uh, 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 collect sexual orientation or gender identity data? Where would you put it? Biopsychosocial? Yeah, absolutely. So um, oftentimes it's collected on intake survey or during a biopsychosocial assessment, oftentimes asked during the visit. Um, I, I'll tell you what I do, which is I put pronouns as part of identifying information. I put it where I put next to their name, um, next to their date of birth, next to their addresses. I sort of put the pronouns just right there because it's, it's just sort of part of somebody's identity. Um, their uh, sexual orientation uh, might go under uh, actually social history. And then if they have a difference of sex development, that kind of goes under medical history. So it kind of, it sort of depends on what I'm collecting, the, the sort of where, where I put it. And usually I record it in the electronic health record. Um, substance use records are protected under um, both HIPAA, the Health Information and Portability Accountability Act, and under 42 CFR Part 2, which um, provides extra protection for the privacy of those records. Um, here is a sample set of questions that you can use in order to collect information about sexual orientation and gender identity. What sex were you assigned at birth? Um, male, female, you can include other. Um, most people aren't assigned another, but I guess you could include it. Um, what's your current gender identity? Male, female, um, trans male, trans man, trans woman, gender career, gender not conforming, or uh, you, I always recommend including like an other field because there are, as I mentioned, the terminology around this is not solidified and people use all kinds of different terms. Um, how do you self-identify as bisexual, gay, les uh, lesbian, or heterosexual? Um, and I mentioned pronouns. Uh, if I was to include pronouns, I would include just a field for people to write it in um, rather than necessarily a him or a she, right? But you, I, would, I would have a field where people would be able to put in their pronouns. And then I always have this field. If, uh, if one of the above does not best describe you, please answer the following. Um, I don't ask about sexual practices on a form. I just think that's weird. Um, but uh, if it comes up, but, but, and, and oftentimes I don't necessarily need to ask about sexual practices unless somebody brings it up in the context of the psychosocial, psychosocial interview. Point is, you can't necessarily make assumptions about what sexual practices somebody does based on their sexual orientation and certainly not based on their gender identity. Um, but there are cases where it's important to ask. Particularly gay men um, who come in with methamphetamine use disorder, a lot of times methamphetamine really is a important part of their sexual practices. And being able to address the sex and love addiction component that oftentimes co-occurs with amphetamine use disorder is really important to know. So it's not that sexual practices aren't relevant. Oftentimes they are, but they're oftentimes collected in the context of somebody's substance use disorder history, not as part of like an identity piece. Um, Health and Human Services has made sexual orientation and gender identity part of meaningful use. Um, and so Jordan reported drinking and smoking tobacco as a teenager, uh, uh, describing this as motivated by the desire to fill, fit in with peers. As a teenager, Jordan was uh, aware of same-sex attractions. Jordan reported a contentious relationship with their mother and moved out from their mother's house as a teenager. And people in, uh, in Jordan's shared house were experimenting with drugs and drinking a lot. And Jordan started to use MDMA, which is ecstasy, and cocaine in addiction to alcohol and tobacco. Um, you could do a sexual practices history to see to what extent does the cocaine and ecstasy use sort of uh, impact some uh, their sexual behaviors. And then um, what else would you need to know? Well, sexual practice history. You know, do you have sex with men, women, both, anyone else? Who puts what where? Do you use barriers or contraceptives? Um, what has been your history of STDs or STD treatment? Um, uh, what has been the history of all these things over one's lifetime or over the past 12 months? But that, as I think of, is like a, a fast and loose back of the envelope sexual practices history. If you know this, this sort of this list of stuff, you're in a decent place and sort of knowing what... Um, about somebody's sort of sexual practices. And um, oftentimes you can link people to STD treatment if they haven't been treated. So we know in uh, the population of, uh, of LGBT patients that seek um, substance use disorder treatment, you can, you can have rates of STDs that it's really important to address. And I, I think that HIV and hepatitis treatment should be integrated into substance use disorder treatment. Um, so, you know, it supports comprehensive medical and psychosocial assessments in the context of substance use disorder treatment. And I think if you collect information in that way, you just lay it out. Hey, how do you identify? You know, um, you know, uh, uh, it's part of the intake. 
we're open to whatever identity or whatever um, uh, uh, gender identity or sexual orientation identity or whatever um, sexual practices information you're willing to share, um, people will ultimately share a lot more if they feel like they're not judging and you're not creating heteronormative or cisnormative expectations. Um, there's a whole textbook on uh, uh, in, uh, international perspectives on addiction treatment that has an LGBT section. Um, SAMHSA has a provider's introduction to substance abuse treatment for LGBT individuals that I would encourage everyone here to check out. And um, I uh, helped with this guide with the Association of American Colleges, uh, Association of American Medical Colleges on implementing curricular and institutional climate changes to improve care for individuals who are LGBT, gender nonconforming, and or born with a difference of sex development. Because again, these are all orthogonally related and you might identify as LGB or T and or be gender conforming or non-conforming and or have a difference of sex development. Those are all again orthogonally related factors. So um, at this time, I, this is my email address. If there's questions that you wanna ask um, to, to me directly without uh, benefit of the full audience. Um, and I have time for one question before we get to our panel. So what question does anybody have? Yes. The, the comment was that um, in the experience of this uh, audience participant, um, the, the ways of asking questions that were posited here are not uniformly done in treatment or even in primary care. And without a uniform way of actually assessing this information, we're left not knowing. So it's really important to ask the questions um, in the context of delivering health services. So actually, that's a great segue. And what I'd like to do now is bring up um, our panel of a uh, person with a patient experience, a counselor experience, and, and a kind of the organizational perspective. So if I could get Mandy, Michael, and Jennifer up to the stage, I'd uh, appreciate it. So um, while, while uh, Mandy, Michael, and Jennifer are coming up, 